Hi, this is your host Sapil Bharti and welcome to T3M, our topic of this month. And topic of this month is Infrastructure as Code. And today we have with us once again, Kendall Nelson, Senior Upstream Developer Advocate at Open Infra Foundation. Kendall, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be back again. <laughs> yes, and if I recall correctly, last time we met at KubeCon in Europe, uh, we sat down and we had some fun discussion there. But I, it's a good idea to always refresh memories of a viewer, especially when we look at your title, Senior Upstream Developer Advocate. What does this title entail? What is your role at Open Infra Foundation? Put simply, I wear a lot of hats. I do a lot of different things for our foundation. Um, probably my two favorite and most important things uh, right now that I focus on are um, bridging the communities for Kubernetes and OpenStack together because there are so many different ways that those technologies integrate. So I spend a lot of time trying to knowledge share um, of the struggles of a, a global uh, open source project. And then my second favorite thing that I focus on lately is um, co collaborating with universities to get more students involved in open source projects and building on the, the programs that they're already running uh, at universities to get students involved upstream and have mentoring of active contributors to those projects. And uh, it, it's very exciting. I love it. It's my favorite thing right now. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk at some point about the work that you're doing with universities as well. Uh, today, since the theme is uh, infrastructure and infrastructure as code, of course, you folks, you know, the early days of OpenStack Foundation as well, you're one of the champions when it comes to whole, you know, provision of open source technology. If you look at the telco story, they were all black boxes, proprietary uh, technologies, but they started embracing open source. Uh, and the whole, you know, today's telco story is mostly software driven open source. Can you talk about uh, uh, the difference between, you know, closed or proprietary infrastructure and open infrastructure and what are the factors that are kind of driving this adoption of open source or open infrastructure? To define open infrastructure first, I think it um, comes down to using open source technologies and tools to provide the infrastructure that was historically maybe in-house or provided by um, some megascaler or, or some group like that. Um, so, uh, to talk about why people are switching to open infrastructure. Well, we have seen for a long time that there is a push to use open source projects instead of proprietary software. And I think that that comes largely because of the community um, and the pool of knowledge that exists around every open source project. That's a lot of resources that any company can make use of and benefit from. And when you see a lot of your competitors embracing the world of open source, it is a push for you to do it too, because otherwise your competitors are going to have a competitive advantage. They're going to be, uh, they're going to have better tools, and they're going to be better tested, and they're going to be um, more uh, diversely used. So they're going to be more robustly built. There are so many advantages to open source and they naturally extend to open infrastructure as well. No, let's talk about uh, infrastructure as code. Um, of course, depending on who we talk to, they might uh, define in a different way. What does it mean for a community a project like OpenStack? I would define uh, open infrastructure as like the, or open infrastructure and infrastructure as code as like a programmatic way of managing the infrastructure uh, like tests, like automated running of tests is a, is a really good example, particularly with OpenStack, because our whole um, Zool CI CD system that we use to run the automated tests and make sure that the code is safe to merge into the, the primary repository um, is not controlled by people. <laughs> it It's completely scripted and automated so that you don't need as many people to scale the tests when you are getting close to a release and there are a ton of patches coming in. So when I think about infrastructure as code, it's the scripts and tools and everything to automate 
the process of spinning up that infrastructure, configuring that infrastructure, and doing all of that uh, operation management so that people don't have to. And the way that we take it one step further is that we manage all of those scripts and configuration files and whatnot in the same way that we manage our like code contributions. So there's code reviews happening on every single one of those configuration changes so that we know that our infrastructure is going to be stable and um, sound and easy to keep running and not have issues. So I, I think that the infrastructure of code uh, as code is something we have really embedded into our community. And I think that a lot of communities could benefit from. Of course, we can talk about DevOps team, you know, but let's just focus on developers. Uh, how does infrastructure as code make things easier for them? There are a lot of like key benefits of repeatability. There are a lot of other things are there. Uh, can you talk about from their perspective how it makes things easier? And if you can also talk, hey, these are key benefits of infrastructure as code. Particularly for communities like OpenStack and Kubernetes that saw the huge explosive growth as a community. There were tons of people around and then we made it over the hype curve and now there are less people because they've moved off onto something else. That's totally fine. And as a community, OpenStack has learned how to rely on infrastructure as code and the management of our infrastructure in a code focused way. And I think that that lessens the load on our infrastructure team and our open dev team uh, to like we're down to a handful of people. And I know it's the same thing in the Kubernetes community. So being able to run the entire tool suite around the, the things that we need to collaborate and being able to run our tests in an automated way, that wouldn't be possible on the scale that we have to run these things um, with so few people if we weren't relying on infrastructure as code. Of course, whenever we talk about these technologies or principles or practices, uh, we all, all, always talk about the culture, uh, people side of it. Uh, embracing infrastructure as code, does it also require a lot of, you know, uh, the way we look at organizations or teams or people or culture? Uh, or, you know, once organizations start to embrace some of these new practices, like the whole DevOps culture, um, infrastructure as code kind of come naturally to them or they do need to look at the cultural side of it as well? I think there's aspects of both. I think that um, the people that are used to doing the DevOps sort of thing and are used to being operators, it's stuff that they've been working on building for a while because they saw the value in it from the beginning. And I think as like developers coming into it, it is a natural extension of how we do code development and the review process. So I think it kind of fits really well with uh, both groups of people. And when you have both groups of people working together, then you get something as amazing as Zool <laughs> and our whole infrastructure set up for OpenStack. What kind of adoption you are seeing already that is there of uh, infrastructure as code? And if you're also looking at either some of the exciting, you know, use case or idea where you're like, hey, these folks are doing it in a really exciting way. I focus more on like larger, more established uh, open source communities. So OpenStack and Kubernetes. Um, so I think that uh, in general, we're, we're both doing it well. Um, it's obviously different, like OpenStack uses Zool, where uh, Kubernetes uses Prow for their testing. But it's interesting to see that we've gotten to about the same place, even though like the, the two communities started so different and like the focus of the actual project is very different being you know, containers versus virtual machines, like, whoa. Um, but we have found ourselves in the exact same position where we can run all of our infrastructure with a half a dozen people. And I think that that is a really interesting pattern that's happened. And I think that there are probably a lot of medium-sized open source communities that as they continue to grow can learn from OpenStack and Kubernetes because we found our way to the same place, even though we started completely different places. And I think that that's a testament to the the contributors and the, the size of the communities and the innovation in both of them. And I think that 
if it can work at the scale that we're both running it at, then it is applicable for any open source community. And the bigger a community you have, I think the more important it becomes to be able to programmatically do these things and utilize infrastructure as code. What advice do you have for teams uh, who are, you know, once again, folks are in different uh, phases of their in, in infrastructure code adoption journey, that they should have right practices, right approach in place to embrace infrastructure as code. Some like best practices and tips for people getting started with infrastructure as code is to um, start smaller because um, you can always add complexity down the road. <laughs> as with writing any unit test, you want to um, focus on the smallest piece that you can confirm is correct or not. And I think that that similar idea can be applied to infrastructure as code because um, you want to make sure that you can spin up your VM or get your workload set up in Kubernetes. And you want to start by being able to pro programmatically do that dependably, reliably, especially if you have a pool of resources that have a lot of different um, like information about like their networking and the amount of storage they have and stuff. You want to start as small and reliably as possible. And then you can add more complexity and more complexity and more complexity. But as you're doing that, you also really want to make sure to document everything as well as you can, because you might not be able to see what you're working on from start to finish. And documenting it is going to make sure that it can be completed in the future, even if you happen to not be around. So documentation and um, start small. <laughs> Kendall, thank you so much for taking time out today and, of course, talk about this topic. And I would love to chat with you again, as you said, right? You know, you wear so many hats, but there are so many things to talk about. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to chatting more in the future.